program, but we thought just to get a couple of things, uh, some groundwork laid about what the program is all about, uh, we thought we'd chat just for a few minutes right here at the top. So please welcome Adam Tendler. So first off, the pre-show, what did we hear as people were coming in? That was, um, those are some pieces that Cage wrote after uh, this piece. They're from like the early 50s, some. The ones that sounded mostly like electronic sounds and random collages, those were different electronic mixes he did with turntables and tapes. So one was called Williams Mix and one was called Rosart Mix, basically named after the people who gave him money to do them. Um, <coughs> Yeah, and the others were his imaginary landscapes, and he wrote five, and number four and five are for 12 radios. Um, and there's a score, but and people have to turn up and down the radios at different points uh, and do different you know, things with the tuner, but uh, obviously whatever you hear on the radio at that time is gonna determine what the piece is gonna sound like. So I wanted to kind of give an idea of where Cage went very quickly after this piece. And uh, lest we think we really have a crappy piano, um, uh, Adam is playing what's called a prepared piano, and we thought we'd let you see w how it was prepared. So if we can go to the uh, piano cam, we'll take a look at as actually what's inside the piano. You want to describe to us how long it took and what we're actually looking at? Um, so... What we're looking at, uh, so Cage is very specific about the materials. He's also very specific about, cool. He's also very specific about where they go in the piano, all the way down to the 16th of an inch. He wants it a 16th of an inch from either the dampers, the black, or the bridge toward the top of the piano, where the metal meets the string. However, what Cage is not specific about, and this, he says, was sort of his first foray, foray into um, chance procedures was, he doesn't exactly say how deep he wants the materials in the piano. He also doesn't say the width or the girth. Um, and some of the materials, it's a little vague what he even means. For instance, uh, in the score on the table, he says screw. That could mean a lot of things, actually. Well, I went to... <laughs> I, I went to uh, a couple hardware stores, and both gave me different versions. And so you can imagine, like, and he doesn't say. And, um, you know, so in this panel, I'm actually using one hardware store's version of a screw and another one's, because sometimes you don't, you know, if it's too small, it's going to jangle in there. We don't really want that. Same with bolts. Um, he says he wants a bolt, but then he also says he wants a small bolt, a medium bolt, a large bolt, a furniture bolt, and a long bolt then there's also the bolt. So you go to different places and they'll give you, they gave me different um, versions of those things. So there's a little conversation I have to have with the piano when I'm preparing it. It took me about two hours, hour and a half to two hours. Um, also rubber, sorry I'm taking so long, but <laughs> um, the black in there is, he says rubber. Again, like this could be, this could mean a lot of things. Like, and I actually used, like snipped up a washers which are made of rubber, but I didn't like the sound. And so I abandoned that and I went and found rubber tubing and I snipped that because he says he wants it between, every note has three strings. So he'll say he wants something between one and two or two and three. And in the case of the rubber, he wants it between one, two, between one and two and two and three. So you have to have a material that's gonna weave through that. He also says plastic. People use like weather siding. I cut up, I was in Texas at the time, we have Kroger out there, a supermarket. Um, <laughs> I cut up my Kroger card, and that's what the white is. <laughs> I just like the sound. It kind of bends the pitch a little bit, but when you put the plastic with the rubber, you get a totally different sound. So, anyway. So just don't tell Yamaha we did this, okay? Yeah. All right, <laughs> okay. Um, now, we can talk about this afterwards when it's done, but the, uh, as far as some of the images are concerned, one of the things you wanted us to know is we're gonna see some of uh, Cage's score. Uh, scores and um, it's so interesting because in a day and time when most compu uh, composers are using computerized stuff and they print it out and they spin it out, this is actually his hand that we'll see up on the screen. Yeah, it's very interesting when I <clears throat> I memorized this piece um, starting with the last measure moving backward. It took about nine months, um, and one of the largest challenges of learning it was to decipher the score. Um, and most Cage scores are still in his hand, his inking. Um, 
we don't know, I don't, pianists and, and researchers, they don't, they don't show us the drafts. I really want to see them because the, the score is so exact. And so we'll see some of them and you'll see exactly how exact it is. You'll also see that the score is very conventionally notated. The only thing unconventional is the preparations that I do beforehand. Otherwise, it looks like a regular piano piece. Um, and if you played it on a regular piano, it would just sound very different. And I practiced this piece silently and I learned it silently because it's so disorienting to learn it and to play it on a regular piano. So uh, I want to just say a word about the form that we'll hear tonight and then anything else. Then, okay. <clears throat> also, I think it's important to know that because we think of Cage often as a uh, chance composer. He grew into this kind of chance music where chance determined what uh, the music would sound like. With this piece, it's not the case. Every single sound you hear, he chose based on his ear. It's a very intuitive piece. It's based on what he thought certain emotional states would sound like. And that will bring us to sort of some of the other images you see. He was, at the time, getting very, sort of this informal, personal, uh, comparative uh, religion course he was giving himself. And at the time, he was very uh, interested in Hinduism, and in, in particular, Hindu art, which there's a certain theory of art uh, in Hindu art called rasa, which separates the human state of existence or, uh, into nine perma permanent states. Um, they are, if I can remember them, they are the heroic, the erotic, the wondrous, uh, the odious, the mirthful, sorrowful, angry, fearful, and they, wait, and then they all go toward tranquility. In the theory of rasa, there's like a dominant uh, state. And so when we were going through the exhibition, I was really concerned with, well, we should find things that sort of, because as a pianist, I've had to sort of think, well, what's going on here? He never says, like, this is the odious movement. This is the uh, mirthful movement. But it's something I've thought about. Also, quickly about the form, the sonatas are in a very strict conventional binary form that Scarlatti used. So there's two parts of the each uh, sonata, each part repeats. So if you hear something that sounds like it's happening twice, it, it is. Um, so both parts repeat, the interludes are more free. The first two are very free, the second two have repeating fragments. So that's good to know, just to give you a little emotional and uh, technical compass for the piece. Okay, all right, are we ready? Thanks. All right, Adam Tandler.